now. They are not at this time deployed in the precise patterns that they were in a month ago, which indicated readiness for an immediate attack, but they are present in international waters just off our shores in great numbers. As of October 11, 1976, 164 Soviet submarines were on station in the waters near Canada and the United States, including Hawaii, and the situation has not changed significantly since then. Since Red Friday, October 1, I have been cut off from contact with General Brown, and none of the Soviet underwater missiles in Canadian and American waters have been removed since that day. As of now, 50 Soviet nuclear missiles and bombs are planted in American territorial waters, plus the three missiles in the Gulf of Panama whose coordinates I gave last month. In addition, seven missiles are now planted in Canadian waters whose coordinates I have already given to Canadian intelligence. My friends, there will be no effort by the United States Navy to remove the nuclear missiles in our waters unless it is forced by a new surge of public awareness and demand for action. Because Nelson Rockefeller's wife arrived in Moscow and on October 12 delivered a personal letter from Nelson Rockefeller to the Kremlin. In this hand-delivered letter, Nelson Rockefeller made the following pledges to the Kremlin on behalf of the Gang of Four. Quote, there will be no further harassment of your submarines, nor will your underwater missiles and bombs be taken up. The credit squeezed by banking circles will be lifted. You will not be required to sell gold. We will send gold for products delivered. American know-how, grains, and foodstuffs will continue to be provided. You must reinstate the Nuclear Safe Zone Agreement." Unquote. The coordinates of all the Soviet weapons now in American territorial waters have been transmitted to a number of reliable men in the United States intelligence community, except for the newest missile, which was planted three days ago in Delaware Bay at 39 degrees, 39 minutes, 35 seconds north, 75 degrees, 32 minutes, 20 seconds west. Action will therefore be possible if the military can once again be free to do its job. At least Great Britain, which had 29 new Soviet nuclear weapons in her waters as of October 11, 1976, is taking action once again to get rid of them. By October 22, Four days ago the Royal Navy had removed all but ten of them and is still fast at work. As for Latin America, all the missiles I revealed last month are still there with two exceptions. British Honduras and Guatemala were targeted by one missile each, but these have now been removed. Our controlled major media tell us nothing at all about the Soviet missile threat that is ready to engulf us in thermonuclear war, but instead divert our attention to the case of the Navy F-14 fighter that plunged off a carrier deck into the North Sea six weeks ago on September 14, 1976. Great attention is being given to the F-14, and we are being fed all sorts of lies that the Soviet MiG-25 Foxbat flown to Japan by a defecting pilot is hopelessly inferior to the F-14, but the Soviet Navy hasn't even bothered to try to retrieve the plane. They already know all about the F-14, and it doesn't worry them. As for the Phoenix missile, which separated from the F-14 when it hit the water, the Soviets know where it is too, but have not yet picked it up. The Phoenix missile is resting on an underwater plateau far to the south-southeast of the point where the F-14 was found. The coordinates of the Phoenix missile are 61, 26, 6 north, 1, 23, 16 west. 
And so, my friends, the Great War game continues. Our armed services are allowed to participate in NATO and other training exercises, but are forbidden by Rockefeller hired hands from doing anything about the real life and death threat now lurking within our own territorial waters. We are being made sitting ducks for attack, and in fact we have already been attacked by the Soviet Navy, because on October 3rd, two days after Red Friday, the Soviet submarines along our east, west, and Gulf Coast performed an experiment in radioactive chemical warfare with all of us as the guinea pigs. Topic No. 2. On October 5, 1976, just as the so-called swine flu inoculation program was getting underway, news reports suddenly told us that we were experiencing fallout from an alleged Chinese atmospheric nuclear blast on September 26. Oddly enough, the initial reports about this came from the East Coast, especially Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Connecticut but certain areas of the Pacific Northwest were soon mentioned as being affected too. We were told that radioactive iodine-131 was showing up in milk at various locations, but we were also assured, as we invariably are whenever any radioactive hazard appears, that there was really no danger. In the days that followed, we continued to hear about the supposed Chinese fallout but other things probably seemed even more worrisome. For example, elderly people began dying of heart attacks shortly after taking swine flu shots, causing widespread alarm at first, but the government quickly assured us that their deaths didn't really matter at all, that they would have died anyway, and the swine flu inoculation program went right back into high gear. And then there were the strange outbreaks of an unknown mystery illness at electronics plants in western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Oregon. The employees, most of them women, experienced headaches, nausea, stomach pains, difficulty in breathing, a feeling of being intoxicated in some cases, and even fainting spells. This time the swine flu vaccine could not be the culprit because the victims had not received it. Instead, some were worried that the swine flu itself had struck. Others remembered with a shiver the equally mysterious Legionnaire's disease that had sickened nearly 200 people in Philadelphia and killed more than two dozen of them two months earlier. My friends, there is actually no mystery at all behind these developments and more like them that you can expect to see. All of these cases I have mentioned are man-made and deliberate, but those who are responsible for them are neither telling you about them nor leaving clues that will be found in normal medical investigations of these episodes. We in the United States are now under attack in a campaign of experimental testing of chemical warfare weapons so that they can be employed later on with precision and devastating effect against us in full-scale war, that is, if we let it happen. For years all the major countries of the world have been in a continuing race against time to discover ever more sophisticated forms of bacterial and chemical weapons, some of them amounting to doomsday weapons capable of destroying all life on this planet. Only madmen would even consider using such weapons, but only madmen deliberately cause wars for their own greedy purposes too, and war is very near at hand right now. A few years ago a nerve gas called sarin was perfected in a facility in Colorado. A tiny amount escaped, and two shepherds and their 7,000 sheep were killed. In response to the public outcry that resulted, a statement was issued that the Chemical Warfare Service had destroyed the sarin gas and were no longer doing such research. But that was a lie. Experimentation still continues today on all kinds of such poisons and at a furious pace. As of right now, 
Many hideous lethal ailments can be inflicted on whole populations as operational weapons. These include black plague, smallpox, meningitis, dysentery, gangrene, yellow fever, tetanus, botulism, typhus, hepatitis, Bangs disease, and Q fever. 30 grams of Q fever is sufficient to infect over 150 million people and it is considered especially convenient since any individuals who are to be saved in such an attack can first be immunized against it. Such selective immunization could easily be done, for example, under the cover of a mass inoculation program like the swine flu program. Q fever, though, is mild by comparison to a new killer gas called AP7, which is being manufactured in Uruguay and Argentina by American and European subsidiaries of Rockefeller-controlled conglomerate corporations. Two thimblefuls properly distributed could kill 180 million people and one pound all life on the face of the earth. Unless and until these hideous weapons are unleashed on the earth, they remain in a condition in which they can be destroyed and neutralized. And it is essential that they be destroyed instead of just being handed around from one agency to another, as Senator Frank Church permitted last year in his shellfish toxin shell game. But other types of chemical and biological weapons are also of great interest to weapons researchers, which can be used in more selective ways or to produce lower order effects than the poisons I have just described. The Soviet KGB, which works hand in hand with the Rockefeller-controlled CIA, now has access to whole families of such chemical weapons which can be adjusted in exact dosage and formula to produce a variety of effects on victims. These were and are intended for use as part of the program to eliminate effective opposition by the people of the United States to the planned Rockefeller dictatorship here in America and our conversion into the most valuable of all slave nations for the Soviet Union. Before these new weapons can be used with confidence, though, they must be tested, and that testing is going on now. As a cover for the periodic episodes of strange illnesses that will occur here and there around the United States, while this testing is going on, the trumped-up swine flu threat was developed. On March 24, 1976, President Ford announced his proposal for the unprecedented nationwide inoculation program, supposedly to fend off the strange swine flu virus. To this very day, not a single case of swine flu has been confirmed anywhere in the United States since President Ford's announcement. Last February, in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 9, I revealed that the government had panicked because of my disclosure that the Fort Knox Bullion Depository contained leaking canisters of deadly plutonium superpoison, and in January 1976 dumped part of the poison into underground streams beneath Fort Knox. Later, when the swine flu charade was announced, I was able to tell you of the government's plan to use this device to cover up the real cause, when and if the poison from Fort Knox began surfacing at various points in the southeastern United States and causing sickness and death. But it wasn't until July of this year, 1976, that I received information about the rest of the swine flu story, and at that time the far more imminent threat of the Soviet missile crisis involving a Soviet double cross of the four Rockefeller brothers had to take precedence. The reason that the government concluded last January 1976 that they could get away with dumping the plutonium poison from Fort Knox into underground streams, which would surely carry the poison elsewhere, was that the swine flu campaign had already been planned for another purpose. That purpose was to serve as a cover to explain the effects that would be